Hey, guess what, everybody? Go listen to the Break It Down show. Hey, this is John. And this is Pete. And this week's guest... Jerome Preisler. Yeah, man. He's an author. A best-selling author. Yeah, and he knows a lot about baseball. Yeah, he uh, he's done some work with the Yankees writing and reporting about them. And his book, First to Jump, is man. about the band of brothers in World War II, the Pathfinders, who were the misfits and miscreants and who went in to kick the asses of people that uh, everybody else was afraid to kick or went on missions that everybody else was afraid to go on. Yeah, these guys picked suicide missions and volunteered for them multiple times. And when they say suicide missions, they really mean it. I mean, you're talking a World War II jump behind lines before the paratroopers jumped in. These guys were there to say, land here. So the planes that they were on that were all giant planes, all side by side, weren't supposed to make it. The guys falling out of the sky fell at such a low altitude, they weren't supposed to make it. They were getting shot at while they were in the air, jumping right into the hands of the Germans who would consider them spies and rightfully shoot them on sight. And they said yes to go do this mission. And besides that, Jerome Preisler is cool. So here it is. Check him out. We think you're going to like it. Ladies and gentlemen, Jerome Preisler. Oh, yeah. thank you. I'm glad you guys, uh, glad that Jim hooked us up. Yeah, yeah, we're excited about that. By the way, it's cold here and foggy and 52, but that's cold for uh, us. 52 would be toasty right now. Yeah, yeah, that stinks. I don't even like to say things like that, man, because New Yorkers and just folks who are used to climates just think we're fancy. Jerome knows. He's been around. Here. Yeah, yeah. He understands. That. I realize that, but when we say words like, it's cold, it's 52. Yeah. Well, you know, my in-laws, my father-in-law just passed away, but they lived in Florida for the last 20 years. And he would call up and they they actually had come from Wisconsin, so they were used to really brutally cold winters. So when they moved to Florida, they suddenly became, you know, the real Floridians. So they call us up and they get like a cold snap of, you know... It would be 65 degrees, and they'd be like, we can't stand it anymore. <laughs> yeah. <It's> like... <laughs> I used to live in Fort Lauderdale, and that's so true. Like, I was able to acclimatize because I, I left a lot because I worked in Iraq and Afghanistan. And uh, yeah. so my body was kind of used to, like, what weather is this? But the folks there, they, they'd sweatshirt up like anything in the 70s. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah well, it's I cold. <laughs> well, you know, it's all, it really is all relative because my wife, we have a place up in Maine. You know, we spent the better part of a, of a decade mostly up there. And now it's, just, it's, this is where, you know, this, now we're back to being mostly in New York. But when we were up there, I mean, I, I just checked, I have the, the Weather Channel app on my phone. And we, we're going through a really bad cold snap here. And it was, it's been very cold. It's, it was, the other day it was eight degrees. But in Maine, it was minus 14. That's not, that's not wind chill. That was the temperature. Whoa, oh my God. God. So, so, you know, it's, it's funny because after living there for, Spending many winters there from for the better part of between 2000 and uh, 2008 or 1999, 2008, when we'd come here and everybody be complaining, even, you know, when they complain about a quarter inch of snow. And I remember our last winter there, which was a uh, full winter there, which was, oh, either 07 or 08, but it was brutal. It was like there was never a thaw. So you would get like a foot and a half of snow and then you get even if it was just like a piddling three inches of four inches, it wouldn't, it wouldn't leave. So everything was just piling and piling and piling and piling until we just had a narrow, narrow, narrow path. I couldn't shovel anymore leading out of our door. That was the worst winter. Plus I had a, a dog, large dog, a greyhound that was uh, getting up there in years and she couldn't walk that well. So trying to negotiate that kind of snow, I just said, that's enough. That was, that was actually our last winter there. Couldn't do it anymore. Wow, a greyhound's not exactly built for winter climates either. No, no, they, exactly. They, you know, they really get cold fast. They really aren't. So it was rough on her. She, we adopted her from a track right that was up there. And that's why, but they're not made for that. What happens when you adopt a track dog? I mean, what's their demeanor like? You know, how old are they typically when they retire them for adoption? It really varies. Um, sometimes you get a dog that's like, what what'll happen is they won't race them till I forget now exactly, but it's like say they're eighteen months, and then if they're skittish, one of usually one of both ways. If the dog seems like it's it's skittish on the track, it's not a huge investment like a horse, so they'll just put it up for they'll get rid of it. They'll put it up for adoption, and uh, if if they have a deal going with like one of these rescue centers, that's that's best case scenario for a dog. So so you might get one that young. In our case, 
Kirby was uh, four and a half years old when we adopted her, and she had been a good runner. Uh, and they all have, so so she was now retired. Four and a half, they slowed down just a, a millisecond, and that's really all it takes in greyhound racing. And they're all different dispositions. She was pretty badly traumatized. I don't know, you know, of course you can't ask her how she was treated. She was pretty badly scarred up. She had scars all over her. Um, a lot of miles on her. A lot, you know, and and who knows what the, what what the scars were from? I, I, you know, you don't, you never know. You just sure. don't know. <clears throat> when we first got her, it's funny because she had been somebody had adopted her and returned her, and she was a, the sweetest animal in the world, but she was very very scared of everything at first. And the one advantage we had was because I don't know how long these people had had her, she knew how to do things that a lot of dogs typically, like if you have a puppy and, and you have a car, you know, it learns to jump in the car and. It, these dogs don't know any of that stuff. Right. So, but she did. She must have, you know, so, so she probably was owned by some, but one for some length of time. I'd say probably at least maybe, let's say six months. So she knew like, you know, right away to jump in the back of the SUV when we got her. She had a life before racing. Yeah. Or after racing, I think it was probably. It was, oh, I see. She was returned to the rescue center. Ah. Um, and why they returned her, I don't know. You know, they don't tell you because obviously they, they want you to take her. I mean, she was gentle. I think that they just had second thoughts. But she ended up being great. I mean, one of the things they always tell you not to do with with a greyhound, and I understand why, is they tell you never, ever walk them off a leash. Don't do not do it. And because they'll chase after a squirrel. or Well, and if they take off, there's no chance you're going to catch them. <laughs> there's no chance. I mean, it's it. So, of course... I'm not discounting had, your wheels, man. I'm just saying. I'm telling you, yeah. <laughs> and I'd had her for like two years. And uh, we, our house in Maine, backs on a hill. And there's really no place you can go when when I'm down that hill. There's, within 50 feet of the bottom of the hill, there's the river. There's woods on one side, thick, overgrown woods. And the other side was this guy's property. They really... She couldn't have gone too far. So I figured I'm, gonna, I'm just going to give it a go. And uh, I let her off the leash... She ran in a, in a, they're used to running in like a circular pattern on the track. So she ran in a circle and she loved it. You just, <laughs> she looked like, you know, it was like freedom. So over a period of about six months, I would do that a little bit more, a little bit more. And then I began taking her to this, um, across the street from us, there was an, uh, a large parking area that was not in use. There was a, a, a healthcare center that had closed. So I would go there at like five o'clock in the morning, let her off the leash and she would just run. And she, and I never, you know, I saw it. So I, you know, if I told a Greyhound rescue person this, they would string me up, but she was great. And uh, I never had a problem. She, she, when I called her, she came and she stopped. She didn't chase after any, any animals. The only thing that she, she had a tendency to do, which is funny was, she she liked cats and so like when we'd be walking she would now I'm, i have three cats but uh two of them were, were cats that i found with kirby you know she would just take a liking to them and and they'd start hanging out they start following us like the pied piper <laughs> wow <laughs> but it, you know they're they're different you, you know you have to kind of you have to be very patient especially early on but they're like the, they're the gentlest sweetest dogs i and i i you know, I, I like dogs, cats. I've had a number of different dogs, but they're they're great. You know, and you and you and you kind of feel you do feel good about it because otherwise, you know, they've they've got no life. Yeah, that is something. I I just I'm just like they're not built for winter. I grew up in California, so when I'm talking to a guy who, you know, wrote a uh, wrote a book about the pathfinders of the 101st Airborne. I'm reluctant to say things like it's 52 and I'm freezing. <laughs> now, uh, as I said, I'm way, w very <laughs> familiar with these conversations. Yeah. So we do want to mention your book. We want to promote your book first to jump and, uh, it's, it's terrific, man. How long has it been out? Not long. Uh, the, I think it went on sale December 2nd, first week of December. Wow. So well, about a month. Eight or nine times you've been on the New York Times bestseller list for your thirty books. That's pretty damn impressive. It's it's I'm I'm happy about it. How? Yeah, yeah it's it, definitely. I wonder though, and I'm not sure exactly how they determine what the New York Times bestseller criteria is, but you are clearly a New Yorker. You've got New York sensibility. Do you think that matters? No. No, because I think, I mean, I, I've never actually gone about looking at how they determine it all. Yeah, exactly. But, it, but it's really based on sales. That's, that's all it is. It's, it's just based on sales. And actually, 
it's interesting that I was um, a service called uh, Nielsen Book Scan. Okay. These are the same, and these are the same Nielsen people who measure TV who ratings. TV or, ratings, right? And um, it 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 costs a small fortune to actually um, to, to actually uh, have a subscription to it. So most it, most individual writers don't don't have it. Usually agents and and the publishers have it. Right. Um, Amazon. Uh, has a, a feature called Author Central, which is you sign up if you're, if you're an author and you've got to get verified and all this stuff. In the last year, they've actually been providing authors with some of the raw book, Nielsen book scan data. Um, it's not it, it's not as comprehensive as if you were a member, but it essentially tells you how many how many. I think it's good for about uh, uh, sixty to seventy percent of sales per week. And the reason I say the percentage is because not not all. Uh, Bookscan bases its its numbers on on point of sale, so it's actually whatever's rung up goes into the into their system. Okay. At particular stores, and this would be major stores, Barnes and Noble, right. Dalton's, those, and, and I and I think Amazon though I'm not positive, but a lot of the indies, a lot of the smaller stores, uh, they don't are count. Not, they don't count in, in terms of Bookscan, which is a very bad thing, and that's that's a whole other subject. Sure it but, is. I do want to explore that subject though, because we've had sure. authors on uh, Jim D. Felice who you know, introduced us to you, he, we touched on this off air, but I, it's worth saying. And the reason that I brought up your New York sensibility feeding into the New York Times stats are it is based on sales. Uh, but we recently had an author named Teresa Rodriguez on our show and she kills on Amazon, uh, but she's not a New York Times bestseller. And we asked her, well, why do you think that is? And she said, well, I think that the New York Times bestseller list has to do with specific demographics around New York, and that's just not my demo. So I don't mind that that's not where I am and I'm not touted in that periodical because that's not, you know, that's not her audience specifically. Mm -hmm. However, your book is, you know, it's about a bunch of rough and tumble guys. So a bunch of rough and tumble guys are going to be your readers, or in Pete's case, a bunch of rough and tumble guy, and in my case, a guy who wishes he was rough and tumble and uh, <laughs> and never served. But... You know, I think that if I'm if I'm to speculate such things, uh, I would imagine that you would just do uh, better in that audience because you speak in a tone and in a way that appeals to, you know, dudes. I mean, you know, it's interesting though. I when I looked at one thing that's kind of neat is when you when you check out these figures. They have a, um, you can call up uh, an interactive map and that really tells you again within 70% what, how many copies you've sold in a particular area. Right. And what was really interesting is that so thus far, the number one city by far in terms of how many copies of the book I'm selling is Massachusetts, is uh, Boston. Is Boston. Okay. And New York is not a, it's not really a close second. I forget what the exact numbers were, but it's significantly behind that and then philly and then what's really what really becomes interesting is you start looking at places like chicago and it's not really moving there but you look at some, at a place like portland oregon and it is moving there wow and, and who knows why although i do know that a lot of you know navy people from from past experience and other books i've written sure. there are a whole lot of navy people who settle there uh, there on the west coast in those northwestern states yeah and maybe they, you know, maybe you've got a lot of people there who like military and just masculine in general, and just overall, yeah, they got beards, so, they got so, beards, so, <laughs> they climb yeah, trees exactly. and shit. Yeah. yeah, so so it's really it's hard to tell, really hard to know, and and you try to figure it out, right? But but you don't know when yeah. when you uh, well, first let me ask you this: Is the book doing well in Kentucky, home of the hundred first, or is it doing well in North Carolina, where the eighty second airborne is? Great question. Thus far, it sold very few copies in both places. And I thought for sure that in Kentucky, it was going to really do well. Right. Now, an issue, one issue in publishing that may impact that, and, and I think I'll have a little bit more, at least, uh, um, unscientific firsthand data, which to me is sometimes pretty good, uh, in, in a few weeks. And that is, first, it's really difficult to get books reviewed nowadays. And different regional newspapers don't do a lot of book reviews. And if they do, you would think, for, for example, that uh, the major papers in Louisville or wherever would would review a book like this because of their demographic. Sure. And yet it wasn't reviewed over there. So how do how do people there know the book is out? Well, either that if 
ho- hopefully they somebody will catch an interview here or I did a couple of others. But if they don't do it, it's it's really really hard. Their their bookstores are are, are fewer and further between right. nowadays. That's you know the independent bookstore long been on the decline. So how do the, how how does awareness of the book filter out there if there's no radio station picking picking up an interview if there's no newspaper doing a story that may be a reason that you don't have see more sales there on february 11th i'm actually going to be at fort knox right at a a great library called the bar library which is which is on base and also i'm going to be doing um a, um, a, a lunch at a nearby wounded warrior facility so i'm interested in seeing whether that can kind of jog uh, or, or spread awareness of the book in those areas because i would think those would be prime areas and yet again it's uh, so far doesn't appear to be the case maybe we can get the show up in time to just proceed that too and see how social media helps push people towards that you know we can we can hashtag 100 first all those kind of things and, would be it would be great yeah yeah you know, just to, um, you know, I, I won't monopolize this, but yesterday I was, um, music is one of my interests, and I was looking at, I was on YouTube looking at um, an interview by a guy named Ian Hunter, rock musician who's been around for quite a, a while, and the interview was done at a, a small record store and actually had records, vinyl records, in, in Washington, D.C., and I was looking at the store, and there was a time when here in New York and in every city there were Many, many stores like that. Now in New York, there, I can't think of one. Not even in, not even small stores. There may be one or two, but I don't know of any anymore. And I thought about the days when you would go into a record store, for example, and if you liked, uh, Frank Sinatra or the Rolling Stones or whoever you, whoever, you went over to the bin and maybe you'd, you'd heard the, the 45 on the radio. Maybe you'd heard an, a friend of yours had one album. Maybe there was a big hit album, Rolling Stones, Sticky Fingers, and you and you went to the bin and wow, here's thirty other albums by the Rolling Stones, and you 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 try them out. And you could go in the listening booth, go into listening booths, or or sometimes ask. I actually worked in a record store. You go to the ma- I managed yeah, one play this. back in the day. So you, yeah, can you can you play can you play a cut off this? It's really similar with books. You know, if people can't go into a bookstore and can't actually look at the look at the at the shelves and see wow you know what's out here it becomes you know how do you browse uh, right you, it's so it's a, it's a different thing and there's, there's there are obviously some some really um positive aspects to online merchandising or but it's drastically I, I, altered the browsing process yeah it really yeah. has yeah you know you remember really being has. young and, and tower was open till midnight so if you had nothing else to do but you had a car you can go to tower and shop and, and learn what was cool. And, I mean, just you, how many times you go to a record store and you forget, oh, man, I was going to buy. What was that record I was going to go buy? And it just totally escapes you. And then you just start exploring. And that was okay because yeah. you had to dig yeah, around. Yeah. Exactly. And that you happened, could, I mean, all the time that happened. That was just that was just the, the overall. That's what you did. Yeah. And, and even with books as a kid, when I started reading. In those days, you know, you'd have in, where I grew up, in, which was in Brooklyn, New York. You, and it was all over, though. Uh, we had ca- what we called candy stores that I guess would now be newsstands, but we had we had the candy store that had magazines and and a paperback rack, or the card shop that had shelves of paperbacks. And um, in those days, and again, this is a whole subject, but the publishing business was very very different. You had local local distributors that were called rack jobbers, and these guys would basically, you know, the guy would take his truck from the warehouse, he'd go to the store. Uh, he'd go to the storekeeper and he'd say, uh, so what's selling? And the guy'd say, well, you know, uh, my, my Louis Lemoore Westerns are going like hotcakes and my, uh, Isaac Asimov sci- science fiction novels are flying out. And next thing you know, he, you know, the guy'd say, oh, next week I'll bring you a bunch more. And that's how they bought. So that's, that's, that's how they had these books on the shelves. So there was kind of like this almost, you didn't need computers to tell you what the local demographic was. They he had the rack jobber, up. and he lived yeah. two towns away at the most. Right, exactly. If you were, you know, 11, 12 years old and you discovered books, Saturdays I would get a couple of bucks from my parents and walk to the local place. And again, I'd stand there and browse. And if I saw this great Conan the Barbarian cover, man, I got Frank Frazetta, Conan the Bar- Bar- right. Barbarian, or, or Lord of the Rings, the wizard on the cover, Gandalf on the cover. These things captivate you and make you read. And and again, I mean, there are 
great things. I don't want to, I don't want to be a Luddite here. I think there's great, great having uh, here in New York. I don't know about in the San Francisco area, but, or you're not, you're, you're outside Frisco, right? Yeah, yeah right. but close by. Yeah. We're, we're well, in the area. So, so right here, I mean, uh, Barnes and Noble, you can order a book at 8 a.m. and by like noon, they'll deliver it online. And, and, and it's, it's that fast. It's they tough to compete with that. Uh, it's it's really hard, and it's and it's a really neat thing to, to have that. And I've taken advantage where I'm, I'm might be researching something, and I come across a book, and I'm, wow, man, I really need this, and boom, it's here. I like that aspect of it and other stuff. But and then with your other guest too, the, the thing I also wonder as far as Amazon is if I I don't know, uh, a I don't know if she um I don't know if she, if she, if her sales are primarily eBooks, and if they are, I have no clue. How ebooks are measured factor into that New York Times equation. Ebooks are a huge mystery. Um, they don't even even in this particular book scan thing I'm telling you about. They don't track ebooks. They don't track ebooks. So the only time you find out about that is when you get your royalty statements, and that'll tell you what what the ebook sales were. Huh. And you have to hope they're accurate, of course. But that's that's when you find out about ebooks. So I don't know where that kind of enters into that New York Times best selling. Right. Mix. I have no clue. I would say that it makes it. I mean, the picture that you paint, which absolutely sounds accurate, makes it so that somebody getting on the New York Times bestseller list, you really have to kick some ass to get on that list because there's a lot of unknown there, and there's a lot of unknown that's trending. I mean, my wife, she has an e-reader, and she that's all she reads anymore. She yeah. has she hasn't had a book in her hand in in uh, probably several months. Yeah. So how many people are there like that? And I would argue a whole bunch. Oh, and I do that a lot now. I I still love. Uh, I mean, to, to me, there's no uh, there's nothing like physical book and and having the paper and feel yeah, of the, the paper, way that the, the paper smells all, and the oh yeah all that. I use um my my e reader for. For research, it's a great thing because yep. I can down instead of you know if I'm looking for material, say some information on World War II, maybe I uh, in in the past would have had to go to a used bookstore and hope it was there and try to order it or try to order get it online and lug have tons of of, of research books stacked around me. I can often find them in, as as ebooks and have it all on my uh, I have a Kindle and just use use the Kindle. And it's a great tool, and I've come to use it quite a bit in that way. Well, um, that's so, clear because when you look at First to Jump, the bibliography at the end of that thing is enormous. Yeah, <laughs> it's huge. So yeah, yeah, I, I, I can a, see I you digging around, and I can see the, the advantage of the Kindle and being able to just you know jump from one thing to the next and have related uh, materials, you know, and carry it with you. you yeah, know, if you're gonna. Yeah, I used to travel back and forth, you know, get on the uh, on the bird to get from Iraq to here. And, back and you know you got to take i'm always reading three books and then you got oh, if i finish i might need to bring this one. Oh, and you know what i've been meaning to get so next thing you know you got five books in your backpack and that's a ton yeah. of weight yeah you know yeah. and then uh it just it was a lot i loved having a kindle in my backpack so i could have 25 books in my fingertips and i read a lot more because of that yeah hey with that bibliography I, i'm curious one what the fact that you can write well enough to sell novels is already incredible and let's not shortchange that but how do you sort out all of that information i mean are you reading the entire article so there's 150 references in this book how, and you're obviously picking certain things out how do you organize that how do you get all of that information into a workable piece ah oh, geez uh, that's a that's a great question i i don't even know how, I, how to answer uh let let me back up a little in, into the process of of writing some of the fiction I've done and I and I wrote I've written a lot of techno well there I guess you could call them techno thrillers I, I I just prefer to call them thrillers I wrote eight books in a series called Tom Clancy's Power Plays and these were big fat books and they were very Clancy yes they weren't exactly like the book that Clancy would have done but they were you know obviously they were in that overall genre anyway in doing those kinds of books there was a ton of research involved. Um, locales, weapons, weapons, fighting tac weapons and what more weapons, fighting tech, combat tactics, strategy, on and on and on, um, global politics. So, well, these are, first of all, it's a series that's created by Tom Clancy. If you're going to 
take the torch. You have to get it right because the readers of that series are going to have some technical knowledge. They're going to have some, you know, their their reading history is going to have informed them, and and you got to get those details right. Exactly, and, and you know, you, you really you, you got to get it right anyway. I mean, if you're if if you're writing a particular a particular scene and it's in a part of the world that maybe you haven't been to, and there's a lot of places I haven't been to. You really need to learn your trade and know and know how to make it convincing. Right. So, and often research, the landscape becomes a character almost. I mean, you, uh, absolutely. Oh, and in fact, that's really true because what happens is you you'll find a feature of the landscape and think, ah, this is a, I can have a cool action scene. Really, really, really frequently um, that happens. Uh, often the weapon itself dictates dictates an action scene. You find a, a cool weapon, you think I, you want to use it, so you, you figure out. How are you going to use it, or a vehicle, or se- or, or s- several vehicles? So off, that's really true. So what happens is, at, in writing those novels, it became an ongoing thing. I, I got, I just got really good at researching, you know, on the fly. In doing, and that really served, came to serve me well when I in doing um, nonfiction. What I, wh- when I begin the book, I have before I've written a word. Obviously, I've done, a, I've done a extensive research, but there's never a a day really that goes by, I, I would have to say that I don't come on something that I think I, I got to double check this or I got to, you know, I better look this up or, or maybe it's just something I, I start wondering about in, in a particular scene in, in, in a book like First to Jump. So I'll do the, so I'll, I'll stop and do the research. Whether I have to get, um, to get an arch- archival paper, try to talk to somebody, whatever it is, you just do it. And the process of kind of like, Folding all of that stuff into the into the the narrative, I honestly can't can't tell you that there is a process other than at this point it you know it's 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 almost intuitive. I just it's all one to me. I, I know where I'm going. I know what I'm trying to get to in terms of telling the overall story. And, and you can uh, almost smell the the nuggets that are going to be useful. I, exactly, and 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 often you know something will come up and it'll be wow. Uh, you're reading one thing, you know, you're, you're researching one thing and some, as you say, a nugget will come up and you think, ah, this is great. So you explore it further and it's just, you, you could almost chart it as a tree type diagram where one thing leads to another, leads to another. Sure. And that really be, is, is as exhausting as the actual writing of the book. I, I find that the hardest part, not, not the hardest, but, uh, um, the most, I guess the most exhausting, I just use my own word. I, it, it, it takes a lot of energy and a lot of time to do that, but that's, that's what it's all about. And it comes through in the end product. Yeah, you, you hope so. Yeah. I mean, to me, I'm, I'm proud of that. I really try to, uh, I, I actually hired a researcher once and he kept coming in to ask me questions. <laughs> and I thought, well, why? <laughs> <laughs> what the hell did I get you in here for? <laughs> I could ask myself these, these questions. <laughs> exactly. I could be doing the same thing and saving a, little, a few bucks. Well, I'll tell so. you what. I, I can't say – I can say this. Having having started first to jump, I'm behind. Pete's read the book, and, yeah. and I've – you know, and I haven't finished it yet. But as I'm getting further and further into it, what is absolutely apparent, you dug in – uh, you dug in deep because I know you didn't live through World War II and you certainly <laughs> didn't live through the uh, the story that you tell uh, of the Pathfinders. The writing just pulls you in and you absolutely are surrounded, you know, in every sense in, of your imagination by all the small details. Thanks. Thanks a lot. The, uh, I tried. Yeah, go I, ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Are you go no, ahead. I was going to say that with this book, the thing I really set out to do with this was I wanted I want I wanted it to be narrative, and 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 the reason I'm kind of stammering is because all my books are narrative. In other words, they're they're written like novels, or or at least using novelistic ne- techniques. In this one in particular, I really wanted it to roll. I wanted it to uh, I wanted to have a, um, as as little exposition as I could, and just kind of like roll with 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 what was happening to these paratroopers from the, from the minute they jumped and then on on through their experiences in the war in in that sense i wanted it to be immersive i wanted i wanted to get that what what they used to call what they called if you've ever read ernie piles great great yes. world war ii yeah uh that worm's eye view of of um of fighting men i was a i am a huge huge fan of ernie piles work and i wanted to if i could capture a little bit of that in, in first to jump 
Man, I think you did. And uh, going back a little bit in time, what we talked about and getting right back to that, it is impressive that you've done you – know, Stephen Ambrose was good at this as well, too. You've taken this very wide topic, people coming in from all sorts of different units and putting – like you feel like, okay, you're in the plane. And then, you know, you scoot over to another plane and another serial, and those guys are there. And you're just you – know, there's a timeliness. You're able to sort out a lot of chaos because none of those guys know each other's story very well. And you're able to get into the detail and clarify things that are wildly chaotic. I mean, one of the reasons why there was such concern for these missions is you just don't know what's going to happen. You know, what if everybody breaks their ankle in one serial? Right. And what and, happens? And, and, yeah. And that was, that's, that was kind of like, um, some of the, that is another one of the difficult things to do when, when, because of the, there's so much going on at, at once and, trying to sort out these timelines. And yet sometimes when you kind of figure something out and you think, wow, you know, this guy thought he was here, but he couldn't have been there. He had to be there. Hmm. And then you kind of double check it and triple check, it, which happened in, in one, one case in this book. And then it kind of leads you to, wow, that's why he's saying, and then suddenly his whole story, because you've heard, I, in, in this guy's case, I'd heard a long interview with him uh, that was uh, in, in a, I think it was in a museum's archive. And I thought, now it all makes sense. And when you can put that together, it's like, you know, you, that's, that's. You're important. waist deep in it at that point. Yeah. And you really feel like you've, you know, it's, it's an accomplishment because you, you, I've, I feel like I've put the story down. This is what happened. Yeah. That's, that's a, uh, that's, that's a good feeling. I, I like that. I did the same thing. I, I wrote a, one of my previous books, Codenamed Caesar. That even more so because I, I, I don't want to get into that too much, but, it was about a submarine, a German submarine near the end of the war. The first submarine and the only so far at least documented, uh, that was, uh, engaged, that was sunk in a sub to sub battle. It was all, it happened off the coast of Norway, but there was a lot of the uh, Discovery Channel, uh, documentary about it and, uh, years ago. And there's been a lot of, there, there, there's some newspaper stories written about it. It never made sense because the, this, in that story, as, as represented, the British submarine that sunk the German sub was notified by, uh, they got notified by an ultra intercept. In other words, they, something was decoded and, right. and it was quickly radioed to them, which was not what happened. It couldn't, it, in other words, the time frame always given is like within an hour, boom. And that just, that wasn't the way things happened in World War II. It took days. Even at the end of the war, when things had sped up, it would have taken days for them to get that kind of the kind of intelligence that was needed to locate this German sub. So then I had to try to figure out, well, what what was it? Because this story doesn't make sense. And then I kind of stumbled upon what was going on with the um, Norwegian underground, and they were really engaged in in in, in uh, a lot of acts of espionage, and um, they had hooked up with with British intelligence and were trained by them. A lot when I started to do really get into that research, it all it all came together for me. Until that point, it made no sense. So they really did. They were really were able to speed the process of getting intelligence. Yeah, because they because the, what what happened was at one point the Brits submarines were based near the Shetland Islands. They were ferrying Norwegian members of the Norwegian underground back and forth aboard submarines. And they would equip them. They would give them radios. And these guy and these people would were known as coast watchers. And you had them in different places throughout World War II. And these, the Norwegian underground would actually watch the coast. And they would they would observe submarines, ship traffic. They would also um, a lot of them were conscripted as slave workers by the Germans um, at the um, the different facility coastal facilities. Uh, they were building, uh, they were building, uh, submarine bunkers. They were building docks. They were doing all sorts of work. At the same time, they were spying on what was going on. And this was being passed on to, to the British. So they were, so they were able to, to combine, you know, the, the ultra data with, with on the spot intelligence. Absolutely. Uh, that was really, really important, especially, um, in that part of the world, in, in that theater. It was, it was really, really a big deal. Yeah. That's terrific. That is a, a really noteworthy thing, too, as, as far as being able to understand the importance of those ally relationships and to take guys who were seemingly insignificant 
who were really subversively able to document things and understand the espionage process and the intelligence processes and make a huge difference. If you like the show, and you know you do, send us some pictures of your movies. Don't do that. Support the show. There are three ways you can support us. Number one, go to iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you listen to podcasts. And leave a five-star rating in with you. It helps with the show metrics and helps us get better placement. Number two, visit our website, www.breakitdownshow.com. We've got an Amazon and an eBay link. Same Amazon, same eBay, you know and love, but they give us a little kickback when you get to their site from ours. And number three, leave comments about the shows that you like. We want to know what you think, how you feel. Tell us how to make the show better. We greatly appreciate it. Now back to the show. We like boobies. Another thing I'd add about that is that they were, uh, of course, they lived in, they lived there. They were a, a con- they were citizens of a conquered nation, and the German reprisals were brutal. If they would find out that that a family member or, uh, was in a, if they suspected you of being uh, a member of the underground. Right. Um, they, they, they would wipe out your family. They would, they would wipe out and they would raise a town. Sure. So these people were at the very least wipe out your family and parade their carcasses through the streets. Exactly. So, you know, when you look at even like in first to jump, I, there's a, there's a little bit about during the um, operation market garden, the invasion of Holland. I write a little bit about what the, the the Dutch underground was, uh, was doing. And it was of course the same thing there. And when you can bring that to light, it is uh, exactly what you say. It's a great feeling because these people were 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 really brave. Crucial. They were crucial and they were heroes. And people don't as often, uh, sometimes especially in in you know, in, in America, we don't realize the kind of risk that that some some of the locals who who are helping um, our guys out are taking on. I, I, it's, it's nice to be able to give them credit. It's gotten easy to make fun of the French. That's one of the things that we lose sight of is the amount of bravery that it takes to be involved and and to you know have an underground movement and nurture that kind of that that kind of thing. Um, so to take a summary break for our listeners, we were lucky enough today to have uh, Jerome Preisler, whose book First to Jump is what we're really excited about. But we're also talking about Codename Caesar. We want to be the record store where everybody looks and, and gets. Excited about, you know, an act, and that act is, is Jerome Preisler today. Yeah. Hey, Jerome, how did you come across the first to jump story? I mean, so many World War II stories have already been told. There's obviously tons of great ones left, but how does it last long enough to get to you, and how did you find it? Uh, you know, it's, it, that's a, a, a question that's, that I can't answer, and I'm just happy that nobody else did. You know, I, I read a, Obviously, it's it's a it's a great interest of mine. So I read a lot of World War II material, and I knew about the Pathfinders. It suddenly dawned. It, it actually just dawned on me that I hadn't seen anything about them other than uh, a half a chapter here, two pages there. And I thought, well, let me let me just let me. What I really did was I started googling and I started looking on Amazon and I started doing my own browsing and I'm real and I started to realize nothing has been written and that amazed me. I think I even did a couple of searches cuz I thought no nah, this got to be wrong. I I got to be mistaken. Yeah. And you know in all the material that's been written Band of Brothers all the stuff about the and there's been I mean these are great books. Uh, there's a, a guy George and I I know I'm I'm, I'm going to blow his name Kasimaki. It's a god it's it's a Polish name and he's a he's he's an excellent uh, oral hist- uh, writer of oral histories. And he wrote several books that I use extensively for background information in, in writing First to Jump. And yet there was not much about the Pathfinders. So I thought, wow, let's see if I can, can do something here. So that's when I started doing my own research. And, you know, from there, it's a matter of write up a proposal and, and, and so on. But, uh, it was, it was really, and, and it often is just like that. I'm kind of like, you know, as as a writer, I'm I'm always looking for something new to write about. I realize that you think everything's been told, and yet you find that that it hasn't. And I've been lucky enough to, to stumble on some of these subjects, and this was one. I, I and this this one totally blew my mind. I was totally surprised. Well, I'm glad you found it too. And I, in my imagination, you know what ha- happens in my imagination because this story is so good, is that there were authors who came before you. Who thought I'm gonna save this one's gonna be my swan song? I'm gonna I'm gonna pack this one away. Just just everybody wait. 
because when I unleash this one, it's going to be terrific. And then they died. It may be. Or maybe, you know, maybe people just don't see it in a story. Yes, it could be one or the other or both. Yeah. Maybe sometimes people see a story and they don't really see what's the uh, compelling part of that story. Yeah, you know, who knows? Uh sometimes what'll happen is when I when I start researching, what really will grab me is um some obscure uh story written in a local, you know, Syracuse, New York newspaper about uh one of the paratroopers uh who's from that that town or or nearby hometown uh, whose hometown is nearby and i read a little little bit about him or his wife and you know it's it's a story from it's an it's a newspaper clip from uh 1944 and i think that's the kind of thing that just you know that just grabs me because i think i, I want to find out what what the deal is with this guy what was his story right can, can i find out and maybe it's maybe it's ser- a little bit of serendipity maybe it's all those things i don't know I don't know. Well, you know what? I I want to shift gears for a minute because there's there's all kinds of fascinating stuff about you, man. I'm a San Francisco Giants fan, Look lifelong out. through Look and out. through. Uh oh, here we go. There you go. <laughs> the good news about that, there's two pieces of good news about that. Is that I actually like the Giants. So I well, see, that's the thing is that we know your association is with the Yankees, and I get to like the Yankees because you guys are in the AL. So there's. I mentioned that just so you know where my loyalty lies, but honestly, my secondary loyalty is to the Yankees for two reasons. Number one, both my sons uh, played baseball through high school. I have a son who's a senior in high school now and just uh-huh. was on a sports show earlier this week that, that talked about high school baseball and, and the, the guy whose show it was, a friend of ours named Tim Fitzgerald asked him, what player do you emulate? And my son is a catcher. Uh, but uh-huh. he said, you know, I don't emulate a particular player for physical reasons, but I love Derek Jeter. Uh-huh. Just because. And I knew you were going to say that. He's too. been, yeah, I mean, yeah. he's just, he's done the, done everything the right way. Everybody knows that he played the game properly. Everybody was in on the send off because he was just the stand up kind of baseball player. And he did all that, did all the stuff right. Aside from that, I grew up in Vallejo, California. Where CC Sabathia is from. Ah, there you go. And uh, and I also uh, share a birthday with Mariano Rivera. Oh boy! So I'll go on the record as saying, <laughs> second to the Giants, I do love the Yankees. Um, and, Actually, know. that's 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 a good point of of honor there. Yeah, being, sharing sharing Rivera's birthday. Oh yeah, birthday. believe you I me. Wouldn't mind that. Well, there's yeah. a plus and a minus to that. We were actually born on the same day. No kidding. Yeah, so it's not just that uh, you know he he's not older than I am, and I bring that up because I look at Mariano Rivera's wonderful career, and I think, Jesus, when am I going to get any fucking thing done? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one day, one day when I was doing, um, I mean, I haven't done the baseball stuff in, in a little while, but when I was doing the baseball stuff, I was on the standing outside the Yankee dugout during batting practice. Rivera was approaching a milestone. This was, I think, a. Uh, I forget what year it was, probably 2011, maybe 12. Anyway, it was, it was, he was, it was a number of saves and I've, and the number pa- passes me by at the moment. He would, he, he liked, he loved to go shag balls. You know, he always secretly wanted to play center field and he was always out. In fact, that's how he got injured. Right, right. Right. Yeah. right. He was, so he was, he was jogging out there and he was jogged past me, past me and I was standing with, couple of guys my, my one of my pals and then um an older gentleman who was um a reporter for one of the latin i think one of the, the spanish language newspapers or or maybe the radio it doesn't matter as far as the story goes and he was um i would guess in his late 60s early 70s uh white haired big white mustache and i remember him standing next to me it was and as rivera was was running by they exchanged a couple of words uh, they were speaking in Spanish and Rivera kept running and, and, uh, this, this, this gent turns to me and he goes, un caballero. <laughs> and of course, a gentleman. And it was perfect. I actually wrote a column where I used that because it was just so descriptive of Rivera. It was, it was kind of a neat, a neat moment that really encapsulates what he and somebody like Jeter as well. I, I did a baseball podcast, uh, maybe a month ago with a couple of buddies who, are actually Red Sox fans and they're up in New England. They asked me, can you tell me anything about from, you know, all your years working with the Yankees? Can you tell me anything about Jeter that, uh, dish out some dirt people? 
Yeah, well, or any, and I and I said I I can't. I said because what you see with, is what you get with this guy. Right. It's it's what what you would see in the clubhouse. What you would see. This this was Jeter. There's there's really nothing. There's nothing more than than what you've all seen. And what you've all seen is obvious. Is is what you you know what you just ex- expressed. The guy was he comported himself perfectly. He was on the field, off the field. His personal life uh, was per- was kept personal. Uh, he never made a fool of himself. He played all the time. He played hurt. Uh, he played, you know, he, he played through all sorts of uh, injuries and he was clutch. I mean, what more do you want from a, a, a good teammate? So what more do you want? Well, what I'm, more do you want from I'm glad you say that because, you know, I don't know any more than anybody else. So to have somebody with the inside picture really say, yes, there's a, there's absolutely a, a reason that everybody feels that way about him. And it's because you can't fake that for that long. No, no, not in New York. York. Right. No, I was going to say not in New York because you're constantly, you know, a lot of, a lot of the players that would, that, that would come from smaller market teams, the, the big point of adjustment or one of them would be, you know, go when, when, uh, after a game, if it was, uh, particularly if it's a, a loss and particularly if during that loss, that player either had, had some, you know, role in the loss, uh, botched the play or, or struck out in a key moment or, or something like that, and they would really overwhelm by the by the uh, uh, number of, of reporters and the kind and the intensity of 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 what was going on in the clubhouse. Um, there was one guy, <laughs> Rafael Soriano. He came in as um, he actually when when Rivera was was hurt for a while, he was he he closed for a while, and he yeah. came in as the you know, and he and he had quite a resume. He had been great with the Seattle Mariners. He'd been uh, great with, um, I think he was with the Braves after that. I'm, I'm not, I'm almost sure. And uh, they signed the Yankees, so signed him for a three-year deal, big, big money deal. Plus, he had an opt-out clause, which was kind of questionable. But anyway, for the year he was with the Yankees, he did. He actually ended up doing a a, a, a great job. But he had a, a hard time adjusting it. And I remember uh, his first couple of months, you know, April, May, he was given up home runs at the worst possible moments and you know it'd be a, 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 the Yankees would have a two to one lead and he'd come in in the eighth inning and uh, give up two runs so they, the Yankees would end up losing by a run but it, it got to a point where New Yorkers were really down on him and he was he was catching it from the crowd and right. New York media was all over this guy and I remember uh, going into the clubhouse and again fortunately as as a I I, I wasn't a reporter I was I'm you know, I approach it the same way I approach any my book writing. So I was writing about. I I was lucky I could write what, about whatever I wanted to write about and turn it in whenever I wanted to. I didn't have to do a column on any given night, week. Uh, it was all uh, it was all up to me. And I went into the clubhouse, and this guy uh, had come out of the shower, and he was stark naked. And a lot of the guys who've been around, like somebody like Jeter, he's always going to get dressed in in that off limits room, you know, where they, t- in the training rooms there. So he's never going to come out. He's going to come out and he's already, he's, he's got the system him. down. Yeah. He, these guys know it, but this guy, he didn't. And there he was. And he, and the guy stark naked in his, in his, uh, trying to get, get dressed. And he just given up a game, either he'd blown a save or blown, um, um, or, or, or given up the game in the eighth inning. Here are the TV cameras and all these reporters. And of course it's men and women in a contemporary clubhouse, and and they're all just standing around this guy as he's trying to put his pants on. And, and I thought there was something about it that made me uncomfortable. I actually, and he and he couldn't handle. It took him a long time to handle it. But I remember standing in that group and telling myself, I don't want to be. I don't want. It, it was odd because I said to myself, I don't want him to see me with these people. I don't want him to see me in this group. I don't want him to associate me with. This These assholes. I, yeah, exactly. Because, because, and, uh, and there were a couple. There was actually one woman who, um, uh, I won't name her, but she was, uh, she was a TV reporter and she actually turned to the cameraman and said, can, can you give him some time and can you turn the lights off the guy to her credit? Yeah. But most of them were not like that. So, uh, yeah, I mean, when a player comes into New York, it's, it's a big deal. I'm sorry. I got, I got that spotlight's I, I bright. No, you know, that's that's a great thing to bring up because here the other guy is trying to deal with it, and he can't even put his damn pants on without having someone jam a microphone in his face. And uh, yeah, or that, somewhere. Yeah, that doesn't go to yeah, the, or somewhere, uh, right? the class of the organization. That's that's not what you know. That's not 
there's a reason why Jeter doesn't do that. He doesn't want to be put in that situation. Um, right. I and wanted then, to say, too, about the Yankees. I'm an admirer of the Yankees. As a person who appreciates baseball and has been a fan of a number of teams, the baseball standard for the Yankees is to win the world championship, and money is not an object. That's not part of the equation. We will spend the money to win the championship. And some people get pissed off about that. Yeah. And so, okay, great. If you're from Milwaukee, whatever, get right. pissed off about that. But the fact of the matter is there is something truly admirable about knowing for a 100 years more than a hundred years. Right. We're out to win a championship. Yeah, we're going to win this. And we're in New York, so let's not make money a, a concern here. Let's do it smart. Right. But that, so as a fan, you know that yes, they're going to charge more for tickets, but they're going to put on the field the best possible team. You're not going to hear like the twins owner, Carl Polad, who's passed now, but he was a billionaire. Mm -hmm. He made right. his he was... billions by foreclosing on farms of the people right. that supported his team. I, I didn't even know that. He's yeah. one of the richest men in the country. Right, right. That's how he yeah. got, that's part of the way wow. he got rich, you know, but wow. he wouldn't put money into the team. And, and so, you know, those fans, your, your guys' fans don't have that problem. The money will go into the team. You know, Steinbrenner's got the biggest monument out there, Monument Park, because he, he was the brand. He made them what they are, you know? Well, well although that, that, um, that model may be changing. Uh, it's, it's shown some signs of changing the, the past two seasons, seasons and, uh, well, the past two off seasons, last, last year they spent, but this year they didn't. The year before that they didn't. It looks like they may be cutting back and it's going to be interesting to see what, what Yankee fans, how Yankee fans react this year if the team uh, starts faltering early on. And they might because they've, because they're, they've, they're really in, in transition right now. So well, we're that, also grossly oversimplifying that what right. what the Yankee model is, but you know, right. I mean, it more than anything, uh, every other team, uh, you know, really could take note from the fact that sometimes you got to be out to win, and, right? And I, make I that really be the first that. thing. Yeah, yeah. I really love that about Steinbrenner, I, and he had it. And, and, and you know, he the man had many, many faults. But you know, to me, there's it's it, there's no virtue in there's no particular virtue in in a team that succeeds by you know, but with draft picks and a farm system as opposed to a team that makes wise financial uh, signings free agent signings to me it's it's one and the same i mean if you can they they're both equally valid ways of doing things uh, you know i'm not an owner of the yankees so their their books aren't my business i'm not because a lot of fans will say you know you know we we want a homegrown team a homegrown team there are yankee a lot of yankee fans who say that right. and to me yeah it's it's nice it, it's nice to be able to follow a, a kid through his you know a, his whole career from the time he's in the minors to when he when he's brought up and then hopefully if he stays with the team which rarely happens anymore through his career like a guy like Jeter you've seen the whole arc of his career and it's a gr and it's a lot of fun it does but, make for a neat story i mean we have a hometown does, kid of sorts here on the giants uh Brandon Crawford who right. grew up here in the bay area and his parents were giants season ticket holders at candlestick and there are all kinds of Pictures of him as a 10 year old hanging out at the stick with a giant's cap on. And that is really, really neat. And those if anybody, are neat stories. yeah, those, and if anybody has a chance of being able to do that just for sheer population size, of course it's New York, but you know, they, they wheel the championship team. And sometimes yeah. you got to reach out. Sometimes you got to reach out to Dominican Republic or Venezuela or wherever you can get the best guy to play yeah. this position in the world. So. Yep. Um, you know, I'm going to, uh, leave you with this comment and then I'm going to open it up so you can make whatever cl closing comments you'd like. I want to close with my New York story, which was, uh, you know, I grew up not only in California, but in Northern California. So that makes me, uh, doubly, uh, soft. <laughs> so when I went to New York, I visited New York the first time when I was about, uh, oh, shucks, I must have been about 12 years old. And my dad, brought us out there. He was working out there for a couple of weeks and was able to bring us for a long weekend to hang out with him. And, and, and we did that. But the first night that I was there, he brought us into a pizza shop to get a slice. And I got up to the counter. It was my turn. And the guy looked at me and said, what do you want? And I grew up in the land of how may I help you? <laughs> but this guy asked, he looked at me and he had a mustache and he said, what do you want? And I froze and I looked at him because I thought he was mad at me. And my dad <laughs> nudged me with his elbow and, you know, in the dad way that comforted everything, he said, 
the man wants to know what you want. <laughs> and I thought, oh, oh, that's how this works. And I got my pepperoni slice and I was happy. And it made me really that one transaction helped me to understand what I, you know, what I know of New York, which is you want it, you ask for it. And when somebody wants something of you, they ask for it. Mm -hmm. So there you are. There you go. I'm going to tell my New York story. So I went to a Yankees game in old Yankee Stadium. The Cubs happened to be in town. At the time, I had a pretty close affinity for the Cubs because I was living in Chicago. I just moved out. And so they had come to play each other for the first time since like the 32 World Series or whatever. That oh, was, was this like two, um, 2005? That sounds about right. Yeah. I yeah. was, yeah, I was at those games. Yeah. Well, Derek Jeter hit a grand slam. His first yeah, grand slam. Yeah, I was slam. at that game. It was a All Sunday, right. Sunday afternoon, I think. Well, military appreciation day or something. Yeah. My not, memories go, yeah. Well, that sounds about right. Cause I was there. I wasn't in the military. I was, I was working as a, a contract Intel guy, but, um, I was kept back on home, back home for vacation. And I said, Oh, I'm going to go to New York. I'm going to go check out the Yankee stadium. Cause I've been to a lot of stadiums. It's one of the things I do. Yeah. Jeter hits that grand slam for his first career grand slam. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to buy that man's jersey. So I went down, and, you know, because you just, you're impressed by how he did it. You know, uh, back in like 95 when they won the championship, everybody said, this team is a team with no Hall of Famers and what a team. No, bullshit. That was never even close to right. Jeter always had that trend towards Hall of Fame. Mariano Rivera was on that team. Bernie Williams is maybe not quite a Hall of Famer, but certainly a good conversation about it. So, um, I was always impressed by those core players that, that did that. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. And what the fans do at uh, Yankee Stadium and uh, Bob Shepard. How do you not love Bob Shepard? Yeah. Oh, man. And, and, you know, the old stadium can't be beat. Just anecdotally, I'll tell you really, really quick, very quickly. That day, there was an elderly gentleman who was signing autographs. Um, I was there as a fan. I was sitting in the stands. And there was a guy signing autographs. And he was kind of making his way around. And I'm looking at him. I'm thinking, this guy looks familiar. This guy looks familiar. He, he was wearing a Cubs jersey. Is this guy just ends up he's Ernie Banks oh, and yeah. he was just I don't know what he was doing just walking around the stands I don't know if he was making his way somewhere he was just standing there signing autographs right in front of me and and I thought this is really cool you know and he and and, and just talking to people and that was that was uh that was that day. That was the day he hit the, Jeter hit the grand slam. I, I sat on the first base side. Were you kind of near me, or were you somewhere else in the stadium? I was actually, as if I recall correctly, I was in. I was probably. I think I was in the third base side oh, okay. that day, if yeah. I recall correctly. And I, my memory's pretty good, so I think I was because it was really hot that day. And yeah. the third base side was always hot. Uh, I remember. Yeah. So. Well, that's pretty cool. Well, we can assume yeah. that at some point. Uh, now that we know that you guys have been in the same room together, I mean that <laughs> same was a, stadium. That was yeah. a big room. <laughs> yeah, that's but a big you guys joint. have been in the same room together. <laughs> yeah, that uh, hopefully the next time uh, we find ourselves in the same room, uh, we have a drink in our hand and uh, we have yeah. some time to kill, and because we love to hear your stories. But but uh, I want to just say uh, thank you. We appreciate you being on the show. Thank you for um, for having me, and I hope I didn't ramble too much. Oh, you did great. Oh, we love it, man. So uh, if you want to support Jerome, get his book, First to Jump. Uh, we'll have the link up next to the show so you can jump right into Amazon and buy it right there. Uh, know that the book is excellent. Are, are the movie rights already acquired? Is it, gonna, is it moving forward on that track at all, Jerome? Uh, no, but, uh, hopefully, um, if you're, if anyone's listening, then they're more than, ha I'd be more than happy to accept, um, any inquiries. Yeah. Um, in, in all seriousness, I, I, I do want to say about this book, I'm as proud of it as, uh, as I am of anything I've written, maybe more proud than, than, than anything. To me, as I say in my intro, and, and it was very heartfelt, it was a real, um, th th it was a real privilege to be able to tell these men's stories. And our, there were different times while writing the book. Um, and especially toward the end uh, when I got goosebumps uh, knowing that I could bring these stories to light. So uh, obviously any author wants people to appreciate their work and I hope that people would appreciate this book. But it, it is a testament to these these soldiers who were so brave. It, it's, it's a great story. So I do hope people will read it. Even if you pick it up at the library, pick it up from your friend, I hope people will read it. Yeah, I hope they do too. The book really, as, as a warrior, as a combat veteran, I can tell you that you've done a great service to those men, told their story, made them look as hard as they absolutely were, because those guys were hard as fucking anything. To jump in, snow, whatever, their life disregarded to support somebody else, even the person next to them in the stick. 
you've captured that. It's intense. And I'll tell you right now, we talked about how I watched the Dirty Dozen the other night prepping for you. I know their story is, is inspired by, uh, by these Pathfinders, but this story is better. And I hope that someone puts it on the big screen because it's absolutely a testament to what you've written and what those, what those men did. Well, here's what I hope to accomplish in my lifetime that anybody ever says the sentence, I watched the Dirty Dozen prep for talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, hey, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we will share links and uh, help you promote. Man, anything that you're doing, we'd love yeah. to have you on. We're big fans. You're always welcome on the show. And uh, for sure, when we come to New York, you don't have a choice. We're looking to it. All right. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. I, I really hope we can we can hang out sometime. Yeah, that'd be great. Terrific. All right. Thank you. We'll stay in touch. Yes. All right. Bye. Bye. This bye, is bye. great. <laughs>